to the there we go meeting is being recorded <laughs> thank you thank you so much for that stacy i'm now going to also ask stacy again if oh, and i apologize stacy has already spoken i am just going to say that of course Caribbean Link social media information will be in the chat and of course please mute microphones and please notify us of any gate crashes or any inappropriate behaviour. I'm now going to move on and I'm going to introduce the brilliant Gina Agnew who is a writer, linguist and poet and I'm going to read out her bio. Gina Agnew is a writer and linguist from East London. Growing up half Indo-Guyanese and half Irish, has proven to be a challenging route to self-discovery, but through research and the power of words, she has dedicated her career to transcribing the stories and voices of those before her to pave the way for our generation. Her interest in her own heritage led her to do a master's in Caribbean and Latin American studies and to learn everything she could about the history of Guyana. She hopes to continue sharing stories, fiction and poetry to connect and communicate with other Caribbean people all over the world. Without further ado, I am going to introduce, I'm now going to ask the brilliant Gina, uh, Gina to speak. Please give Gina a huge clap. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, the clapping is deafening, honestly. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna, oh, um, I might need permission to share my screen up here. But, um, I just wanted to give an introduction to what I'm going to be presenting, which will make, which will be um, just a history of Indian indentured servitude, um, and then how that has consequently led to the multiplicity of identity in the Caribbean. Thank you, Afia. Um, also, while I'm just setting this up, thank you to Afia and Stacey for having me. Um, I've been following Caribbean links for a while now, so it's really lovely to be a guest. Um, so, as I said, this is what we'll be going through in the next 15 minutes, just a history of indentureship, particularly on the, um, in East Indians, the multiplicity of identity in the Caribbean and how that sort of framed my own experience and then just ending on sort of actions and awareness that we can think about to support our Caribbean communities. Um, on the right is just a picture of my great grandfather and mum in Guyana. Um, and um, recording in progress. Um, um, there's, there's a there's few, a few sorry, I can hear myself. <laughs> I keep okay. Um, okay, so. Just as a history of indentureship, before we fully get into it, I wanted to bring your attention to this word at the bottom here, which is coolies. And it's quite a controversial word in some aspects um, because it was used for a long period of time as a discriminatory word. So the original, um, what I heard about it, the origin of its word came from Tamil, meaning coolie, but I've been to Guyana Speaks events before where they've told me tons and tons of different origins of the word originally. Um, the reason it, that it's quite controversial is because it was used discriminatory, discriminatory as a discriminatory term, pardon me, and it was used as like by the British to refer to Indian indentured labourers. So there is that sort of history there, that sort of uh, relation to that but there has been a lot of literature and a very popular book called Kuli Woman by Gaitra Bahadur um, where the word has sort of been reclaimed in a way and used like to describe the common history of Indian diaspora so I wouldn't go around like using it willy-nilly but just so you know what it means um, so indentureship is an agreed contract of labor, so to speak, um, in which the compensation is delayed. So it's for Indian indentured servants in the Caribbean, it would be five years of work um, after which they'd either be promised a return passage to India or a plot of land. And in 
compensation for their labor, they would be granted food, board, and medical um, assistance if needed. Also, they were promised. Um, so in 1833 was when the Slavery Abolition Act was passed. And no sooner than, no later than five years later did Indian indentureship begin. So the Kalapani in Hindi translates as the dark water because it was literally an adventure into the unknown for so many Indian people. Um, it's important to mention as well that these contracts that they were signing, a lot of these people were illiterate, so they didn't really know what they were signing. They didn't know what they were getting into, but it was, for example, in Uttar Pradesh in the north of India, there was a lot of poverty, so it was seen as like an opportunity to escape or make a new life somewhere. Um, I wanted to mention that although I am focusing on Indian indentured servitude, indentured laborers came from China, Africa, Ireland, Poland, Portugal, Syria, and Lebanon. So the Indian indentured laborers were actually the last movement of people, even though it was in some countries a sort of continuous flux. Um, so this is just how it happened. So on the right here, this fusty old man is Gladstone, John Gladstone. I would call him sir, but I don't really feel like it. And he was the one who wrote a letter to Sir George Gray and said that unless a system of regular continuous labor is adopted, then sugarcane cannot be carried out to a productive result. And so bearing in mind, in this time, it was all about sugar. Sugar was the commodity. It's an extremely addictive substance. And when slavery was abolished, obviously they had to work out their economics somehow and figure out a way to keep the influx of sugar without having to do the work themselves. Um, so, with Indian indentured laborers, they would sign a contract, which is called a gurmit, which would um, agree to have them work for five years. Um, in return, they would get land or a ticket back, as well as accommodation, food and medical. On the map here, this red region here is where is Uttar Pradesh, where most, well, a large population of Indian indentured servants came from. Um, they also came, the port was in Calcutta, but also there were Madrasi Indians as well, and even some from Nepal. Um, on the, in this box here are the different Indian arrival dates where, um, when it was the first time that they arrived from India in Grenada, Guyana, St. Lucia, Jamaica, Trinidad, St. Vincent and Suriname. Recording in progress. Um, I wanted to flag Clem Sisharan's research because he's made, he's done some amazing writing on the role of women in indentureship. And it's really important to know that for a lot of women, like for example, if a young woman had been married and widowed that her husband would die, it was sort of against the norm to remarry. So they were sort of stuck in this um, middle phase where they couldn't remarry nor could they return to their families. So this was like a different opportunity for young women, young Indian women. Um, also the question of karma that I mentioned here is that if a woman was widowed like extremely young, the sort of mentality according to Dr. Sishiran was that because of karma, something must have happened that meant like you have, you deserve this, so you need to stick it out on your own. So it's a very difficult like situation for a young woman to be in. So the opportunity to sort of start afresh and escape famine, cholera, poverty, um, was a reason for women to leave India. So it's important to note that although lots of them were bought as laborers by the British, some women of their own volition decided to go and had the agency to go in hopes of starting a new life. Um, <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, it was mainly Northern India. So a lot of Bajpuri culture was brought over to the Caribbean. 
um, the living conditions in the logies, which was the accommodation, the name of the accommodation that they had, uh, were extremely poor. So much so that in the late 1920s to 30s, the Moin report um, was sort of carried out across the whole Caribbean and it exposed the terrible living conditions that Indians were dealing with in the Caribbean. Um, the report was like, I think the investigation was carried out in the late 20s, but it wasn't exposed until the late 40s. So we'll come back to why that happened. Um, but the main differences that Indians were dealing with once they arrived in the Caribbean and sort of adapted to, to produce Indo-Caribbean identity today was the erosion of the caste system, which was very rigid um, in India. So um, essentially it's erosion meant that women had more autonomy and were more empowered. Um, they also played a role in solidifying extended families and maintaining the family dynamic. Um, which has a high economic implications as well for how you, um, for how life goes in the Caribbean. There was also changes in languages and dialects. So bearing in mind how huge India is as a country, not everyone speaks the same language, not everyone has the same accent, culture, religion even sometimes. So this, all of them being in working in the same role and sort of handling the same conditions is one of the aspects which has produced the Indo-Caribbean identity. Um, so after the contract, as I was mentioning, they would either return to India or get their own plot of land. Um, so many of the Indians ended up staying, but the ones who did choose to return to India, most of them returned to the Caribbean after returning to India. And this was because of the sense of rejection of their families, like in their family in India. Either they couldn't find their family, obviously this was in the 1800s, so finding your family after you've been in the Caribbean for five years would be very difficult. But also there was a sense of rejection, like once you've crossed the Kalapani, you're not really seen as true Indian to some people. So there was that sense of feeling rejected and feeling like you're no longer fully Indian. On the right, on the right here is a letter from um, one of my ancestors from the year 1910. And they're writing to someone, one of my family members who has moved to Guyana and they're begging him to come back to India essentially. So they're saying, we have a desire to see you here in the country of your forefathers, leave the Kalapani and come back to the country of Mother Ganges and Tribani. So this is showing how like the, like sort of the division and the understanding of what Indian identity is and where India is as sort of like the holy land religious, whereas um, the Caribbean is a completely unknown territory for most Indians. Um, so just segueing into identity, um, how does this relate to me and who I am? So my paternal side, my dad is Northern Irish and my mum is Indo-Guyanese. She was born in Demerara in Guyana, um, lived in Georgetown for a bit and then moved to London in the 60s. Um, and what makes it a bit more complex is sort of explaining to people that there are Indian people in the Caribbean, um, first of all, and then sort of <laughs> and like, I do also have to explain where Guyana is to a lot of people. So it's a very difficult, there's a lot of explaining to do essentially. Um, but I feel like there are three main narratives that I've come across whilst trying to like uncover my Indo-Guyanese-ness. One is the transnational Indo-Caribbean identity. So Indo-Caribbeans from Guyana, uh, Trinidad, Suriname, St. Vincent, Jamaica, St. Lucia. 
Um, there's that conversation going on. But then there's also that of the Caribbean diaspora. So in uh, Canada, Toronto, particularly New York, London, there's huge Indo-Caribbean populations. So I found my way into that conversation. And then there's the larger conversation of Indian identity as a whole. So Indian Caribbean and South Asian communities in the US particularly, there's this idea of sort of, I don't wanna use the word purity, but like proper Indian. And like, if you're Indo-Caribbean and Indian, there is a difference there. Um, I'm not sure if anyone watched Indian Matchmaker, but that was an issue brought up as a Guyanese girl, like she was worried that she wouldn't be able to marry an Indian man because she's not fully Indian. So Guyanese exceptionalism is a well, as well sort of uh, delays the conversation because as you see, Guyana is on the continent, yet it's considered as a Caribbean country and also it's the land of six peoples. So it's quite an <laughs> explanation I have to go through if people can be bothered to stay and listen by then. Um, in terms of um, researching my own identity, the difficulties I've found are how people identify themselves and how others identify them. So there's differences in terminology, like in America, they call Indians, like they call Native Americans Indians. So that just adds another <laughs> buffer to the issue. But the main issue is, is that a lot of our histories and a lot of Caribbean histories have been written by the colonizer or the empire that has colonized them or rewritten even. There's not enough dependence on oral history. And as Scott was mentioning before everyone joined, um, that's, I think it's a disregard for Creole and other languages outside of English. English is seen as proper, but, and Creole is not. But if we're to listen and understand the histories of those and the families of those who have un undergone these things, we might stand more of a chance in actually understanding what happened and moving forward. There's also tons of administrative inaccuracies, which I'll touch on towards the end. Um, and then the variations of names. So uh, a little story is that I've been trying to trace my family history. And the issue is, is that in the Caribbean, particularly, we have call names, house names, book names in Indian. The book name is your name at the hour and time that you were born. So my granddad's name that we know him by isn't even his real name. We know him as Paul Diodat, but his real name is Dronajai Paul and Diodat was a nickname. But as he arrived to the UK, he had to have like a more simple British appealing name so he's changed it and so when I asked him his real name it was just completely different so how am I meant to trace my family history if all of these names have been different the whole time so that's made it quite tricky but it just emphasizes what like the the need for oral histories and for tracing these histories um I just wanted to touch on different cultural elements as well, because my dissertation, I focused on the different elements where Indian identity and culture is present and music and particularly that from Bollywood films, music has really been a tool where how um, Indian identity has been reconfigured in the Caribbean, but also as we were listening to at the beginning, Chutney Soka music is the prime example of Indian Caribbean identity. Um, there is an incorporation of Hindi, Bhojpuri lyrics and English, um, but it's a sort of, it's a sensory nostalgia that you get sort of with food as well, because imagine if you watch Bollywood films as a child and then you hear different elements of it in your, in songs. Is, is that sensory nostalgia and it sort of solidifies your own identity and your mixed identity, that, that fusion. 
Um, this is similar with food. So sensory experiences and tradition. The thing that has made me feel most indo Guyanese is my nan's cooking. And um, if it wasn't for her buckets of plowry that she would make me as a child, I don't know who I would be today. Um, but it's just, it's, it's just such a rich experience. Like eating Guyanese food, it just makes me feel 100% Guyanese. When I eat Irish food, I feel a little bit nauseous, but the difference is there. Um, also, Hindi is used in the domestic sphere. So um, the the plate that you make roti and paratha on, I've always known it as the the tawa. I've never known it as like a an iron plate or whatever the English would call it. Um, and it's the same with lots of different like bara, like lots of different foods and utensils. So that's another way that Indian culture has been preserved. Um, yeah, some <laughs> Guyanese cooking Instagram pages there, but they'll come towards the end as well. And then education and literature. So what I loved most about doing my masters was how I was able to explore folklore, storytelling, oral tradition, and traditions and stupid superstitions. Um, I feel like there's something about um, a story like, or a Nancy story, for example, from Guyana, that is just so engaging and it's just told in the voice of my nan. It just, it really resonates and it's, it's beautiful. But unfortunately, Creole seems to, people seem to view Creole as improper. So, or humorous, for example. So I think there needs to be more um, for example, I have this book called Buxton Spice by Unya Kempadu would recommend. Um, and she uses Creole and just in the narrative and the conversation and it's normalized and we need more like that. Um, this was just another recommendation that I had, um, especially for Indo-Guyanese identity. Um, it's it's only a really short book as well, but it explains the sort of concept of belonging and all these waves of people over time have come to Guyana. Um, yet we still have a large indigenous population. So it's just sort of breaks down the, while using sort of superstition and traditional tales like um, the Masakura man um, to, unpick identity and who really belongs and who is a guest and um, things like that. It's all the things that comprise identity. Um, so for my final section, just some actions and awareness that I think we should, we could do to um, offer support to Indo-Caribbean communities. Um, as Scott was mentioning as well, decolonizing the curriculum, not only in Caribbean countries, but in the UK as well. Um, Operation Legacy, for those who don't know, was a process in the 60s and 70s in the UK where the British government basically destroyed a countless amount of documents to sort of hide the atrocities of the, the years of empire. So not only are we like halted in progress in that aspect, but I feel like we need to learn a lot more about the Caribbean and the British role in the Caribbean, like from, from years seven onwards, even before that. Like I didn't know, all I knew was that I was from Guyana and that I liked Guyanese food and music. I didn't know the intricacies of the history until I was about 19 or 20 when I was at university. Um, so it should be on the curriculum and we need to realize the role that the British have had in Caribbean identity, not just the British, but you know, a lot the British. <laughs> um, and it, I think it would just clarify for a lot of Caribbean people in the UK, like Afro-Caribbean, Indo-Caribbean, it would just clarify where we've come from and where we're going because that's just so unclear right now. 
the perception of the Caribbean is just so warped in my view. I don't think people understand the diversity and how much that it is the original melting pot. But I could uh, I could go on for like a while about that. And then finally, I was asked a question about compensation and it just, it made me think, I do think there should be reparations and compensation, but I don't think it's likely because the British government paid 20 million pounds, the equivalent of 70 billion pounds today to compensate slave owners for the loss of capital associated with freeing slaves. So rather than paying those who suffered slavery and indentureship, those who enforced it were compensated for the loss of property. So that just tells you everything you need to know, unfortunately, about the British government. But I think that the actions that we can do to raise awareness, to talk, to have these conversations about generational trauma and to offer support, um, I think that's in our hands at the moment. And like, I mean, it is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, so people power is in our hands. And I reckon we just need to keep having these conversations, raise awareness and make people take accountability, regardless of whether they're directly associated with the atrocities or not. They've clearly benefited from it in the modern day. So, um, yeah, I would meant to end it on a lighter point. <laughs> so I've added some mangoes and masala and the Cutlass podcast here. But um, you get me started on the British Empire and I will not stop. So I'm glad I could end it on here. These are just some Instagram pages that I follow that are incredible and informative and provide great resources especially Journey Through the Generations. It has great pictures of Guyana um, like from like the 50s and 60s, even before that. Um, the Breadfruit Collective is really good for environmental rights and its connection with women's rights. And thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I hope I wasn't too anti-Britain for your liking. <laughs> but I love Britain, but what they did to the Caribbean, I don't love. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. Can we just please just give Gina a huge clap for that because she really, she really explained so much. And thank you so much for that. It was a really brilliant, really brilliant presentation. Thank you. I'm now gonna pass over to the brilliant, uh, I'm gonna pass over to the brilliant Stacey who's gonna introduce Dr. Aisha. Thank you, Afia. Um, just to, and thank you, Gina, that was very good. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, if anyone has any questions for the speakers during their talks, please feel free to put it in the chat and then we'll pick it up at the end and ask the speakers. Um, but yes, I would now like to introduce Dr. Aisha. She is a paediatric trainee in the West Midlands. Her um, heritage is of Jamaican and Sri Lankan, and she has an interest in global health and nutrition. And she also enjoys craft, cooking and traveling. Over to you, Aisha. Hello everyone. Um, so I don't really have a presentation, I guess I thought I would just talk about, I guess my life is probably the easiest way to do it and my culture. Um, I think a lot of what Gina's talked about has really resonated with me and I guess my experience of, of growing up. Um, so just a bit, a bit of background about my family. So I'm not Indo-Caribbean, I'm actually Asian and Caribbean. So my dad was Sri Lankan Tamil, or is Sri Lankan Tamil. Uh, my mum's mum is Jamaican. They actually met in the UK in Essex uh, back in the 80s. So my grandparents came to the UK as part of the Windrush generation. My grandfather was in the RAF in Blackpool um, and took the offer to come here and raise his family here. Uh, my dad, as well as a lot of Sri Lankan Tamils, uh, came to the UK because of the civil war that was going on in Sri Lanka at the time. Um, many of them went to, um, to Britain, Canada, Australia, in different parts of Europe as asylum seekers and refugees because of the violence. Um, so that's how, that's how my parents met. Um, and then essentially 
uh, I came along a couple of years later and at the age of six months, um, my parents then moved to Jamaica. Um, and I guess the background of that seems a lot more clear to me now more than ever as I have spent the last of year to two years listening to experiences of what was going on in, in the UK and in Britain for young black people in the 60s, 70s and 80s, because that's what my mum would have grown up around. Um, and again, with my grandparents being from the Caribbean, like many people, the dream was to always go back home. Um, and so I think just when I was born, my mum just decided, right, we're doing it. So I spent the first 10 years of my, 10 and a bit years of my life in Jamaica. Um, so for all intents and purposes, I'm Jamaican. That is my background, that's my culture, that's where my roots are. Um, and then at the age, just before I turned 11, we moved back to the UK, uh, moved to London. Um, and that's really kind of where I got to learn about, um, I guess, my Sri Lankan family, because before that was just, it was kind of, you know, I knew it was half Sri Lankan, but it's just a culture that I didn't really have much understanding or experience of. Um, yeah, so I guess a couple of things, I guess I'll, I'll start with how I want to end. And I think the message that I want to get across um, kind of harkens to, to what Gina's already talked about, which is just about oral history um and really knowing where you're from um which I think is really difficult sometimes for for third culture mixed race um young people um I think you know my parents weren't perfect but I think one of the best things that my parents did for me was to move me out of the UK at a young age um because I grew up where I was from um, so in terms of, I guess, identity and culture, and I think some of the things that I see a lot of young people now, um, and even people of my age struggle with and navigate, I never, I never really had that because as far as I was concerned, like I knew I was British and I had a passport, but I'm Jamaican and that's, that's who I am. Um, and my, my family were very much into their, especially my grandmother, um, into kind of their oral history and you know our background and where our ancestors were from so I grew up with stories of like you know so my, my, my family actually from Clarendon in Jamaica you know so we'd go to Clarendon you know three four hours drive and um, to go see my great aunts we'd go to the land which you know my family used to own and they would say you know this is where you know this is where I used to play this is where we used to do this this is where your great-grandfather built this shack built this house um and you know you kind of walk through walk through those areas um and that's that's always been a big part of my identity and and, and who I am um and I just I just think that's that's so 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 important it doesn't matter which part of the Caribbean you're from or whether you're of mixed heritage or what your background is like it's so important to to pay attention to that history and to you know if you still got your grandparents around to to take time to listen to listen to them and to, to get those stories because everyone's everyone's experience is different and everyone's history is different and I think if we don't make the time to do that once those relatives are gone they're gone and that history is lost and it's so much harder again like Gina said trying to trace back all of that stuff in hindsight um so I think that's yes the main point that I want to get across um so for me, uh, growing up in Jamaica, um, me and my sister used to be called Cooley, Cooley Kids. Um, I, I was going to get my hair out to show you all because everyone's always really fascinated with my hair. So I've got really kind of curly type 4C hair. Um, my sister looks completely different to me. She looks Tamil. Um, and actually our experiences both in Jamaica and the UK were very different based on our appearance. Um, so I've obviously got slightly Asian features with my nose and everything, but, you know, she looks more Tamil and was was treated slightly differently because of it, because she's darker. Um, so, yeah, so we, we were often called Cooley. Um, again, growing up in Jamaica was was great um, compared to here. Um, but I think the, the, the main thing I think that, that was different, um, you know, we got drilled you know, education and things got drilled into us at a very young age. Um, I can relate to the whole not speaking Creole, not speaking Patois. Um, my grandmother put us speaking Patois at home. 
it was licks because um, you had to speak standard English. You had to write in standard English, you know, and Patois was for like, you know, if you're out with your friends, but, you know, not spoken in the home because um, it was felt to be improper. Um, so, yeah, I guess I guess that's all I really want to say about Jamaica, because um, I could I could talk about, you know, my childhood and stuff for ages. Um, I guess the questions that I've got that I was asked to kind of go through were just about navigating, navigating the, the tension between those cultures, both in Jamaica and in the UK. So um, I guess in Jamaica, the, I guess the challenge, the challenge was from, from the Asian side um, was there was, I guess there was this expectation for us to be, to be Asian and Indian when we weren't. Um, so the only thing we ever knew was, you know, was you kind of, you heard stories in the distance, but apart from, I guess, again, the food that my dad cooked at home, um, which was Sri Lankan food. We didn't really know much about that culture. Um, but I never really felt like I was, even though we were called Cooley at the, you know, at a young age, we didn't really, I didn't really understand the history behind it. It was just, I thought it's just what you called Indian people. Um, but I never really felt kind of discriminated against. Um, there were a lot of Indians, um, like I had lots of Indian, like Jamaican Indian friends growing up. Um, but all very different. So some were Hindu, some were Buddhist, um, a few Muslims, not very many. Um, and that was probably where we shared the common ground because my dad was Hindu. Um, and so there were bits of that culture that I could relate to. Um, I think the contrast came when I moved to England. Um, that's probably the first time I really experienced any kind of discrimination and or feeling like I need to fit into some kind of mold. Um, and I found it really difficult because I didn't really fit in with the, the Caribbean, the students of Caribbean heritage that were at my school that were here that were in London. Um, and I didn't fit in with Asians either. Um, so from the, yeah, from the, from the being a Jamaican side, so I guess you had all the British kids that were like, you know, oh, do you like Bob Marley? Do you eat jet chicken? Do you like cool runnings um, at school? But um, because my experience of what it was to be a Jamaican was, was firsthand, I, I kind of knew who I was as, as a person from the Caribbean versus um, without wanting to sound too, yeah, versus I guess some of the people who I was in school with who were, I guess, learning what it was to be a person from the Caribbean from their grandparents um, and often had very stereotyped, restricted um, ideas of what it was to be from the Caribbean or, or to be Jamaican that I didn't fit into. Um, so that's and I think that's that's a challenge. And I think that's that's kind of where that point of tension often is. I think even now with young people is that the knowledge is often second, third, fourth hand. And, you know, it's not possible for every, you know, if everybody could go back to the Caribbean, I think that would be like the best thing ever. You could just, you know, get people there for a summer just to see what it's like to taste, to smell, to touch for themselves. Um, but that's often where the tension lies. So I found that really difficult. And then I didn't fit in with the Asians either because I didn't really know anything about my Sri Lankan family or the culture at all um, until I moved here. Um, but again, I think that side of my heritage has influenced me a lot more as I've, as I've become older. Um, so much more than the food, it's about kind of, um, you know, the importance of family and tradition. Um, that's that's held on really tightly within because there's a there's a big Sri Lankan community within within London um, and different parts of the UK, um, and that's that's something that I found really important and I've I've um I've gotten a lot of comfort from in, in difficult times. Um, the other things I guess I've been asked about in terms of religion, food, music, culture. Um, so there are a few Tamils in the Caribbean, um, not very many in Jamaica that I met, but there are there are a few. Um, and the influence that I experienced growing up, um, again, it was very much around fusion of fusion of food, fusion of music. That's kind of 
where I think everyone everyone would find a common ground. Um, you know, so barbecues, cookout, fish fries, we'd have a mix of like all the curries, all the fish, all the jerks, all the pickles. Um, and and that's kind of like, again, like Gina said, that's kind of where that melting pot and common ground is, like in the fusion of the music as well. Um, within language, again, for Patois specifically, and again, this is just from memory, I can't think of any specific like Hindi or Tamil words that are in Jamaican Patois. Um, no, but I'm, I mean, I, I hardly ever hear it or speak it, so that might be the case now, but I don't know. Um, and yeah, I think what was the other thing I wanted to say? Um, just, I've just lost my train of thought now. Um, I think what, okay, what impact do you think specifically that Asian cultures have in Caribbean culture? Um, I think a lot. I think, again, for me growing up, um, yeah, there was, and it's, it's, it's so different to talk about if I think, because if I think about my, my childhood versus, versus now, um, as a child being in Jamaica, you had, you had your, you know, you had your Indians, your, your Indian Jamaicans, your white Jamaicans, you know, the, Afri the Afro-Caribbeans, the Chinese, um, we were all just Jamaicans, um, that was just, you know, like, fine, we had slightly different backgrounds and you know maybe people had actually come directly from overseas or you know had, had grown up there from generations but we're all just Jamaicans um and that was that was where our commonality lay I think within British culture that's not really something that I've experienced um I think yeah and I think that's something that I still still probably I struggle with because I, there are things that I can I can share with, and again, I'm sure anyone here that's mixed race or from different cultures can expect there are, there are certain experiences and things that I can share with my, my Sri Lankan family that I then can't, that then don't translate to my work colleagues, my, my British work colleagues, or, or to my African Caribbean friends. Um, and you kind of find yourself having to almost compartmentalize the different bits of your culture because they don't all quite meld meld together um and I think yeah and I, I guess that's kind of when I'm in with a start in the end I think that's where identity becomes really important um because even within that um, especially as a teenager when you're going through that whole like oh what am I doing who am I what do I want to be um the one thing that I never had any difficulty with in terms of my identity was knowing where I was from and that's because it was drilled into me from a very young age. So my grandma, you know, if you ask my grandmother, and I'm on both sides as well. So you ask my grandmother, so my grandmother would say, you know, you're British, but you're not English. You're Jamaican. This is where your culture comes from. This is who our family are. This is what, you know, this is, you know, where your ancestors are from. This is who you are. Um, and I can actually, I'm very, I feel very privileged because I can actually do that on both sides. I can do that on my Jamaican side and I can do that on my Sri Lankan side. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, so my dad, when I was small, would tell me, okay, you know, this is, you know, this is where our family's from. Our, fam you know, our family's from Jaffna, from this part of Jaffna. Our grandfather used to do this and this is what he did. And this is what our other grandfathers used to do. You know, we were farmers. We did, we had this x y and z so you know a, a common thing is art so I, you know i paint um i was going to show you some of my stuff but it's way back there um but art is like a big thing in my, my sri lankan family so my great-grandfather was like a, i think great-grandfather was the famous artist um in jaffna um you know so whenever i painted anything they were like okay you know that comes you know that comes from our family and this is you know this is you know this is what we were about we were crafters we were farmers we, you know we did x y and z um, and I think that's formed a huge, a huge part of, of who I am and how I, how I navigate life, because that's always centered me. Um, so I guess to end and come, I think those are all the questions I think I had. Let me just check. Yeah, I think those are all the questions I had to, to answer. But um, I just think coming back to end, how the point I wanted to make at the start is, I think that for anyone, it's, you know, from the Caribbean especially, um, if you haven't quite yet and you, you've got older older relatives around, 
and you've not yet taken the time or maybe had the opportunity to listen to them, to, to listen to them ramble on and hear their stories about what it was like back home. Um, or even even to get a history book and you know and go and go digging. Um, that it, it's so important for us to record our history ourselves because again, like Gina said, people aren't going to do it for us. And it's important for us and for the future generation to be able to pass that information on. Um, and I, I personally have always felt, and I still feel like a lot of the issues and the trauma and the hurt that is experienced by some of our young people um, comes from this identity crisis because, you know, they, you know, they grew up in the UK and they're British and, you know, that the, the, the Black Caribbean, but the British Caribbean, and actually, they sometimes will get to a point in their teens where Britain rejects them um, in you know, multiple forms, which again, I won't go into either. Um, but it's really important for those young people to know, to know who they are. And I think for all of us to know, to be grounded in, in where we're really from. Um, you know, we live in Britain and Britain is great and we're British, but to know, to know really where we're from um, and to know our history and to know our own personal history and not just you know, say the collective history of, you know, Jamaica back in the day, like what's your, what's your story? What's your family story? Um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you for having me. Aisha, thank you so much. Can everyone just show a round of applause? for oh, Aisha, thank you. <laughs> Got a heart from Gina there. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think I just want to quickly say, I think for me, it's very interesting to hear that you found in Jamaica, you were at home and yet you came when you came over to put back, should I say to Britain, um, the so called multicultural society that you felt that you had to fit in or, or you couldn't fit in somewhere. But yet where you know, Britain's meant to be a multicultural society. Yeah, I, still don't, I still don't feel at home here. <laughs> yeah no it's, it's it's very interesting it's very interesting but thank you it was lovely hearing your story um i think i'll hand over to afia to introduce our next speaker thank you very much for that stacy and thank you so so much dr aisha just just brilliant thank you and and of course thank you so much gina just brilliant as well i am going to introduce vida vida who is an elder and a retired architect, and I'm going to read a short bio. Vidir Elsie Dindaya of London is a retired architect and was a part time lecturer, born and brought up at Blairmont, a sugar plantation in British Guyana, the former colony now known as Guyana. He was educated there and at Delhi University. After managing part of the family business in British Guyana, he emigrated in 1962 to settle in London. Here he qualified as an architect and enjoyed a rewarding career in architecture. Keen on community service, he is a JP and until he retired has been a magistrate in South London, a member of the Social Security Appeal Tribunal and the London Regional Passengers Watchdog Committee. He was a member of the Disability Appeal Tribunal and the Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Committee. He takes a keen interest in interfaith activities. He is fascinated with a rich cultural heritage, European, African, Asian, Amerindian and American, a microcosm of the world of Guyanese. Impressed by the success of Guyanese of a small population, he values role models. These are celebrated in his books, Guyanese Achievers UK and Guyanese Achievers USA and Canada. Wow, just absolutely amazing. I will now, please can we have a huge clap for Vidur? Thank you, Afia. One of the, thank you very much, it's very impressive so far. One of the stars in my book about Guyanese is sitting here with us, and that is Professor and top academic Cynthia Pine. I regard her as, can I say, like a sister. I'm old, but if you forgive me, Cynthia, or, or a niece, but there we are. 
Yes, we have a rich, rich culture. That is okay. what I am very proud of as a Guyanese. Please, could you tell us about the history of, well, um, uh, I think it's, it's Gina. Gina, who, who in fact knows a lot more detail about our, the Indo, Indo Guyanese history, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just briefly tell you with the abolition of slavery in British Guyana in 1834, in the British colonies, Mauritius found itself in the same boat as Guyana with not having enough labor to run their sugar plantations. So they, they got a shipment of 75 laborers from India and, and they found them very good. And so they, they continued to have that until they got about 7,000 by 1938. And in Guyana, of course, British Guyana, the sugar plantation owners were in difficulties and they wanted to get uh, workers because slavery had been abolished and they were, they were hard, hard of getting workers in their, in their states. So they got upon this idea of, of um, legislating and then acquiring labor from India and various other places apart from India. And the first batch of 414 came on a contract. There was a contract set up of indentured labor ship and of, for five years, they'll work there. And after five years, they'll be returned back to India where they came from. So 414 came in, in two ships. Um, Gina mentioned the, the, the term coolies and mo most of them were, were from villages and, and that around Calcutta. They set up an agency in Calcutta and, and that's where the main recruitment was done. Mainly from you, the people came mainly from United Provinces, which is the central state in the north. Uh, I think because of famine and various other problems resulting from war. So they were looking for work and they were taken, etc., etc., and ended up in Ghana. Two ships came there, Whitby and, and Hesperus, and 306, 396 was the total people that ended up there. The whole system of indentured labor ended in 1917, but a few shiploads of people were, were continued to come who had gone back to India and re returned as free settlers to Guyana. That is in 1921, 22, and 26. There were, of course, grave abuses in the early years. And the rigidity of the, the system was inhuman in many respects. But um, that didn't crush the ambition of the people who went there to get on in life and to make progress because in my opinion, they found that they were able to do better there than where they had come from in India, from the villages and so on. So it the difficulties instilled in them habits of industry. When indentureship ended, they were virtually on equal footing with the rest of society. And as time went on, we all know we've had some celebrities from amongst them, including Sir um, Sonny Ramphal, who was Commonwealth Secretary General for, for some time. And of course, President Jagan of, of Ghana. And they, are, they came from the same background as, as, as most of the in Indians there. Could you tell us about your experience growing up in the Caribbean and what life was like for many? Well, personally, I grew up in the sugar plantation and it was simple life for me. The sugar plantation was a, a, a self-contained sort of community. And, 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 and uh, what we knew, there were do's and don'ts. You don't go into the white folks area. You weren't uh, tolerated there. The white overseers in the sugar plantation had their swimming pool, tennis courts, etc. And of course, we like to see the tennis being played 
And if we were around, we became ball boys. But at school, I enjoyed my schooling. My, the most memorable uh, thing about that, the old school in the plantation was my head teacher who was a near, neighbor to us where we lived in the sugar plantation. She was a black lady who was like an aunt to me. My parents respected her and so on. And she came over the years to, to our home when we had any functions, birthdays, etc. At school, we weren't taught anything about Indian history. We didn't play Indian music or sing Indian songs. We lived like Indians within our community. It was a self-contained community. Everything about us as Indians, we did within the community, free to do what you like within the community. But outside of that, you didn't, there was no support for anything Indian, except indirectly. At home, we lived our Indian way. We ate Indian Guyanese food, dal and rice, potato, vegetables, and fish, very occasionally chicken and, and lamb. We played Indian music, sang Indian songs, and saw Indian films. On Sundays, we went to the Hindu temple, and on Hindu festival days, we celebrated to the full. Everyone participated, similarly at weddings and funerals. Socially, most people joined in on festival days. So Christmas for us Indians and Hindus was a very big day for us, like Holi or Eid. And at weddings and funerals, everybody participated. There were a few higher up people who didn't mix with everybody. That was normal and no problem. We accepted that there were people who were not, didn't feel that they were equal to us, they were higher up and so on. In my te teens, teaching and color and Thai government jobs were not open to people like me, Indian, and I wasn't Christian. But that didn't exist everywhere. It, it existed in most parts of the country. We were brought up to take our education very seriously because the alternative was working in the cane fields as a cane cutter. That was the worst possible job in the heat of the sun, with your hands, barefoot, etc., and get cuts and all that. That's the loneliest. And that was the threat always at the back of our minds. If you don't do well at school, that's what you're going to end up being. At, at school, we learned the basic subjects like maths, etc., and mostly about Britain, less so about America and other countries. The newspapers also covered stories about Britain and the world outside. People with a good status were top business people, professionals, civil servants, or teachers. People who had lived and received higher education abroad, they, they did well. So to better myself, I thought the, the image I've got about how I could better myself was simple. To become a professional, that is a lawyer or a doctor, and second best, to be a teacher or work in the civil service or doing nursing, pharmacy, or being a lawyer's clerk, etc. How do you think Asian Caribbean cultures can continue to be preserved, especially so that younger people can learn about Asian Caribbean cultures? Well, I, I can think of three initiatives. One is to identify when we talk about Asian Caribbean culture, what are we talking about? Can we spell out what we mean? What is relevant and valuable in our life? One thing I can think of, working hard, saving, etc. those are values. Next thing is teaching about that culture. In Britain, we learn a lot about British and English culture, but there's no teaching effectively about our indigenous culture. When I say indigenous, I'm of Asian extraction. They're friends of mine of African extraction, Chinese extraction, Native American extraction. We should know about these things. They are relevant in life. And, this, and, and so the teaching must go on at primary school, secondary school, university. You can do research into this. 
uh, Gina has done research in, in it, and therefore we shouldn't have to search for it. It should be available easily and be positive about it. The culture is positive. Every, everybody's culture is, is relevant. And, and, the, the build, and then the third thing is to build reminders everywhere. Like wherever you go in, in, in the old countries, in, in Britain, and I, I, I've studied in India, wherever you go, you will see statues or some things to remind you of some great person in the village or in the community, etc. We need to have that reminders right across the board of people who have contributed. I mean, like my sister, Cynthia Pine, she is a great role model. And therefore we should have wherever she came from or whatever, something to remind the young people, look, there you are, somebody who's gone very high in the world and done well. So that to keep alive and enhance the cultures. Don't forget, I'm talking about a world where we are respecting cultures and all of that. I grew up in a world where this was not so. There was only one culture that was 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 having a go. If you're white, you're right, and if you everything else, you 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 don't count. Now that world is is gone. That's different. So regarding aspects of culture, these should be explored and defined. Religious festivals, Christmas, Hagwa, Eid, Diwali, Holi. I know in my village where I grew up, harvest, um, uh, church harvest was a very important thing. I don't know if we have it here in, in the UK, but it's a very important thing as a community. Hindus have jags, which are reading of the religious text over a few days. So it becomes a community thing and people attend and so on and so forth. And pujas, Asian Caribbean music and dance, Asian Caribbean weddings, funerals, rituals, ceremonies, etc. Dress and food, these are dress and food are they're very important things and they're everyday things. And we shouldn't just relegate these things into the background. They are very relevant things. Teaching in schools, colleges, and universities, the history of Indian indentured labor system should be, should be fully cataloged and the development of Asian Caribbean people economically and in all respects. The Indians have done extremely well, the Indo-Caribbeans, in, in be becoming, in my opinion, the economic engine of places like Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, et cetera, et cetera, because of values that they live by and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and people should know about these things. Monuments and other physical reminders should be erected widely as reminders of local achievers, et cetera. What impact do you think Asian Caribbean culture has had on Caribbean culture, religion, et cetera, food damage. Well, there's one thing that I'm very much aware of wherever I've been. When I was in India, I discovered an, an attribute of, a guy, of me, a Guyanese, and I was embarrassed sometimes to, to talk about it, but I found myself rather popular. I'm not normally that, but because I was able to mix with everybody. That's a natural thing that came with me as a Guyanese and I was very, I did well as a result of it. So Caribbean culture is readily recognized worldwide and we've, Caribbeans have done well in, in proportion to our small population worldwide through aspects such as we are unreserved, we're not, we don't hide in any way. We're open, social ease, warmth, uninhibiting friendliness. We're friendly and little attention to differences of ethnicity, race or religion. I did not grow up with, 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 with any of that. Although you knew there was barriers, etc. But the thing is when you meet people, no matter whether you're black or Indian or Chinese or white or whatever, it didn't affect us in our everyday life. On religion, the widespread presence of Asian Caribbeans of the Hindu and Islamic faith, as well as of various denominations of Christian and Jewish faiths has enhanced the respect and regard Caribbeans generally have for faiths as a whole and has enriched their cultural life in this regard. Asian Caribbean food 
is today very much a part of the variety of Caribbean food, especially Korean roti. On language, there's some, as I, I think I should say, there's a little iffiness here, but, but on language generally, we, we, we would know if you look into it a bit, long before Asian, Asians went into the Caribbean, Indian words were in the English language like bungalow, chit, chutney, cut, dacoit, dungaree, guru, jungle, loot, mantra, punch, pajamas, thug, and typhoon. These are in, these derive from Indian words. But Indians in Guyana have made these words part of the local language, like maraj, langra foot, when somebody's got a lame foot, pandit, dal, puri, roti, chana, bara, pulauri, jilebi, kichri, bakshish, Baigan, Basa Basa, Sem, Bora, Betty, Dhoti, Kurta, Sari, and Orli. These are words which are common in Guyana. With regard to culture and music, I think there's been a two way traffic impact on life and culture of our peoples, Indo Caribbeans, and the rest of the population. The cultures, the cultures and music of both groups have rubbed off on one another. That's my feeling. And I'm pleased to say that when I meet non-Indian Guyanese and Caribbeans here in the UK, they value respect and are very complimentary about the attributes, culture, music, and food of their fellow Indo-Guyanese Caribbeans. So with those few words, I will close my little story and thank you very much for the opportunity to say my piece. Thank you, very nice. Thank you so much, Vidur. Can we please give Vidur such a huge clap this time? Well, I want to clap for myself, it's all right. It's, we're, we're all clapping, it's just, um, Thank it's you. just the, 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 a lot of us are on mute, but we're, we're really, really grateful uh, to hear from you and to hear especially about life in, in, on the sugar plantation and all that you experienced. And I love the three points you made about how younger people can learn about uh, Asian Caribbean culture. And I didn't actually know, this is something you know, I learned that um, there were, there are quite a few Indian words that were in the English language long before people of Indian descent were in the Caribbean. So I've, I've learned a lot. So thank you so much for that. I am now going to pass over to the brilliant Stacey um, and I'm going to ask her to please introduce Scott Tinnocky. Thank you very much, Afia. So um, yes, Scott Tinguki holds a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from the University of Guyana and serves as a literature teacher, assistant examiner of CAPE Literatures in English and a subject panel member of the Literatures in English Syllabus Committee. He was a writer in residence at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine Campus Trinidad and Tobago in 2020 and is the author of the novel Red Hibiscus. Tinyuki has also published poems in the Guyana Annual, Caribbean Quarterly, and In Search of Mami Wata. He was longlisted in for the 2021 Johnson and Amoy Achong Caribbean Writers' Prize in Poetry. His research interests include the Chinese Caribbean experience, Caribbean literature, post-colonial literature, medical humanities, and literary, literary and cultural disability studies. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Just give me a minute to start sharing the screen. Okay, so this afternoon I will be talking about a brief overview of the Chinese in the Caribbean. And in terms of the layout of the presentation, I'll start off with the Chinese in the Caribbean as a whole, then I'll zoom in on the Chinese in Guyana, and then I'll bring it to a close with a little bit of my personal story and experience. So let's go. Chinese in West Indies. Now the entry of Yes, the entry of Asian labor into the Caribbean plantation system started in 1838 after the emancipation of the slaves. Now, between 1838 and 1980, just over half 
a million of new immigrant laborers had entered the British West Indian plantation system. 80% from India alone, 7.5% from Nigeria, which would be the Portuguese, and 3.5% from China. A five-year contract of indenture binding the laborer to specific plantations for that time period at a fixed rate of, rate of wages with severely limited rights of physical mobility outside of the workplace environment. So the thing is, they did not come as states. They came as indentured laborers. So they were paid a wage. They were given certain privileges, but it was still restrictive. Now, British Guyana was fortunate enough to receive 56% of the total. 55.6% of the Indians came to British Guyana. 76% of the Chinese. In Trinidad, they only got 29.4% with 33% of the Indians and 15% of the Chinese. While Jamaica got the smallest amount with only 10% of the total with 8.5% of the Indians and 6.4% of the Chinese. The organized migrations of the Chinese into the British West Indian plantation system really started after the Opium Wars. Because what that war really did is that it opened this once closed off country to be more exposed to Western labor, which was a major shift. After an abortive attempt in 1843, the British West Indian migration commenced in 1852-1854 to British Guyana, Trinidad, and Jamaica. Then there was a five-year lapse caused by difficulties in stabilizing recruitment end of the operation. Now, this happened because of several reasons. One, the government would try to intervene to make sure that things were done in a legal and acceptable manner. But even so, the British did have a lot of power. So even though the government tried to intervene, it was not always successful, but it did cause lapses within what they would have called the Chinese experiment. Now, in addition to that, and this is the part I really love, because in the letters, if you were to read Walton Lucas' documented history of the Chinese in the West Indies, he has letters where these lords were like, oh, the Chinese will be perfect. They're so docile. They're so submissive. And there are lapses within the Chinese experiment because of mutinies that happened on board of ships, because of rebellions that happened at the recruitment offices. People, sailors were killed. Buildings were burnt. And remember, you are talking about farmers. Yes, people from the poorer classes and so on. But many of them would have known some amount of martial arts. Many of them would have been familiar with some way of fighting and defending themselves. And that is something that actually happened quite a bit, which is why one doctor surgeon by the name of Eli would have described the ship he was on at, a, at some point as a barrel of monkeys. But yeah, moving on. It started again in 1858, 1859 and continued on an annual basis of 1866. And then after that, there was a lapse and it never truly recovered. It just fizzled away. Now, the Chinese in Guyana, they became professionals and business owners. However, there was little attempt to maintain their cultural connections. Now, this is the irony of it. That even though British Guyana was fortunate enough to get 76% of the Chinese laborers, they did not maintain that connection. Now, if you were to check this against the backdrop of Trinidad and Jamaica, that was not the case. Even up to the 70s and the 80s, there was a Chinese newspaper that was still in print that was still being circulated, and it was all in Cantonese and Mandarin. 
and it was a important thing within the culture because they wanted the younger ones to still maintain that connection to China and those cultural connections. In the National Archive in Trinidad, they have contracts, indentureship contracts, still in good condition that families would have kept and preserved over the generations and then would have done, donated to the National Archive of Trinidad and Tobago. Jamaica as well boasts a very impressive preservation and conservation of Chinese artifacts and relating to Chinese history. Guyana, unfortunately, that was not the case. They simply assimilated in order to thrive in a strange land. But there are some major contributions that they would have made in Guyana, and that would be St. Saviour's Church, the Chinese Sports Club, and Central High School. St. Saviour's Church was established around 1874 by the missionaries. Now, this was a church intended for the Chinese community within Georgetown. And this was more than just a church. And this also ties back to the loss of connection. Many of the Chinese immigrants who came in were already converted Christians before they entered the Caribbean. So this process of erosion had already started because some of them were already Christians, already had interest in learning English. So that had already started. They had already started mimicking Eurocentric ideals. Hence, St. Saviour's Anglican Church. And as the immigrations continued to happen, even persons who came in that were not Christians or were not devout Christians, they found themselves drawn to this church because it was more than a church. It was a place of networking for the Chinese community. There they could have heard hymns being sung in Mandarin and Cantonese. They heard complete sermons in Mandarin and Cantonese. So it was a way of them still connecting with their culture while at the same time it was being eroded as well. A bit of irony going on there. And so it was not just a place of worship, it was networking, it was family, it was community. The Chinese Sports Club, which was called Cosmos at one time, it started informally in 1924. Now there was a Chinese lodge in Ghana and these lodge members were some of the more wealthy businessmen and they created a sports club. The highlight with this venture came in the 1940s, I think, when the Chinese Guyanese tennis team went over to Trinidad to have a tennis tournament with the Chinese Trinidadian sports club. And that was the major highlight of this sports club. It still exists, but it is now part of the Guyana Motor Racing and Sports Club. And then finally, Central High School. Central High School was founded in 1927 by a Chinese immigrant's son, Joseph Clement Locke. Now, G Joseph Clement Locke was a member of the Chinese Lodge. He was also one of the founding members of the Chinese Sports Club, a major figure in terms of Chinese Guyanese history. And at the time, it was one of the best private secondary schools. In 1976, it became a government school. And of recent, it has been renamed as the New Central High School. Now let's talk a little bit about my area literature. Now here I have Chinese Guyanese literature. The first one, John Lo Shineborn, who is considered one of the founding writers of Guyanese literature. She has written a lot of works. Time Peace, Chinese Women, The Last Ship, Godmother and Other Stories, and The Last English Plantations are just a few of them. And in all of her works, she deals with the Chinese Guyanese identity. How is it, how do you balance Chinese-ness and Guyanese-ness? What does it mean to be a Chinese Guyanese? These are all issues that she grapples with. Michelle Janet Chan, in her debut novel, Song, which was published in 2016, also does same. But she does it from a historical perspective and she explores a lot of things like the Chinese sports club, 
the Chinese Masonic Lodge and all these things and brought it to life. Now, in terms of myself, I have my novella of Red Hibiscus, which is fantasy historical. It's set in ancient China. And, you know, they get visions of the future of Chinese identity and they try to make sense of it and if they try to get prevent it. But in addition to that, I've also published some poems, and these are the three poems I've identified. The Scandal of Otai Kim, which is steeped in Chinese Guyanese history. Otai Kim was actually the one of the founders of Hopetong in Burbese, which was one of the first Chinese settlements. The three Chinese settlements that started it were Hopetong, Christianburg, and Wisma. And then eventually you had a prominent Chinese community in Windsor Forest, also that area. Now, Otai came the scandal with him having an affair with a African Guyanese woman in Georgetown and that whole thing. So I wrote a poem about that. Her feet is about women and the employment they got through in the interest because it gave them more freedom. And well, Barrel of Monkeys, that's me talking about Dr. Eli and what he said about the Chinese apportionship. Now about my personal story. So identity was always a big issue with me. I, growing up, I always thought I was not Guyanese enough because technically in terms of linguistics, the Chinese and, not the Chinese, sorry, the Africans and East Indians, they really created Guyanese Creole. They're, is a clear connection that continues up to this day to their native culture and their native identity mixed in to create Guyanese-ness. That was not the case with the Chinese. The only thing that the Chinese, that is of Chinese origin that has survived to this day would primarily be food. Because remember things such as religion and names and so on, that would have been eroded with time because they were in the Guyanese context. They were very eager to just assimilate and move on with their lives. And what you also found happening in Guyana, Guyana was treated as more of a transition point. Once the family had accumulated enough wealth and resources, they migrated further to the States or Canada or UK, so greener pastures. And I can also connect to what Dr. Aisha was saying earlier in that you didn't know where to fit. And this was always interesting for me because good, as growing up, I'm in classrooms. I, so the classroom you have predominantly, depending, you're gonna have Afro-Guyanese, Indo-Guyanese, you're gonna have Amerindian, you're gonna have mixed. And so now I'm like, okay, I don't know where I exactly fit in. And then thing is, I'm a mixture of Chinese and Portuguese. So, and that's the, I would like to say statistically insignificant communities because majority of the Chinese and Portuguese would have migrated, they would not have stayed. So now here I am, a mixture of the two and you didn't really have to know how to fit in. And then this is where I love the point that uh, Vidor would have mentioned in that you had to learn to just socialize and relate to everyone. And what that caused after a while is that I felt as if you know I wasn't Guyanese enough. And there were even times in my childhood I would have prayed to God, wishing that I would somehow end up becoming a little bit darker so that I could kind of blend in a bit more with my friends. Because I I most of my friends were Afro-Guyanese or red or mixed with in or you know Bofiano or Dogla. And I wanted to kind of like fit in a little bit more because I felt like a bit odd and I stood out too much. And what this caused me to do from a very early age, I realized I had to create my own sense of Guyanese-ness. And that was important for me. And I had to do that by appreciating the cultures that surrounded me. And that's how it started as a child. Me learned to accept the fact, yes, but I am still Guyanese. And I had to learn to accept all the different cultures around me and appreciate the different aspects about it. And it, but I started this process of molding, 
which is something that Jan Lo Scheinborn talks a lot about in her novels, where you have, in most cases, the protagonist comes to realization that their Chinese heritage is not significant to their Guyanese-ness. And they kind of throw it off and embrace Guyanese-ness as a different sort of identity. But for myself personally, as I grew older in my 20s and so, I tried to create this balance where I try to reconnect with my Chinese heritage. And this is where Red Hibiscus comes in. For me, Red Hibiscus was more than just me trying to be a writer. It was an important spiritual journey for me. When I wrote this book and it was going to get published and all that, I was like, okay, if at least one person reads it and likes it, I'm satisfied. It's just that this is the book I think I always wanted to read as a Chinese Caribbean person. I th always thought that this is the book I would have wanted to read to help me maneuver this identity crisis that I would have had as a child. So by setting the book in ancient China, I had to go back, way back explore Chinese religion, explore Chinese culture, explore where my ancestors would have come from, and then create some kind of connections to the Caribbean future that they were seeing. And it helped me to continue my, my journey of self-discovery. And it, it pushed me to do a lot of research in terms of Chinese Caribbean history, in terms of Chinese Caribbean contribution, and I've learned from a lot of the greats. I've read things by Marjorie Kirkpatrick, Walter Luklai, uh, Victor Chang. It was amazing. And so that's me as a writer personally. I try as much as possible in the things that I write to bring that out because in my opinion, that's an aspect of Caribbean literature that you don't really see. The Chinese Caribbean experience being voiced. So in closing, it's important that we realize that the Chinese Caribbean, the presence of the Chinese in the Caribbean rather, has transformed the cultural landscape. Their history is also important in the fabric of Caribbean fields. And Chinese Caribbean voices are important, viable, essential in history and literature. Wow, that was just truly stunning. Thank you so, so much, Scott. Just all of the presentations have just been brilliant. There's just so much I can take from that. Stacey, do you have anything you want to add? No, just say thank you very much. They're very, very insightful. And again, thank you for sharing um, your experience. Thank you. We are now, if, Nathaniel is here. We are now going to introduce our last speaker for this event this evening, Nathaniel Cole. We're very grateful, of course, that he is also able to join us this evening. He is a writer, researcher and workshop facilitator. And I am going to read his short bio. Nathaniel is a writer and workshop facilitator working across masculinity, mental health, relationships, and sex education for young people and, uh, and diversity and inclusion. He is also the co-founder of Swim Dem Crew, a group that uses swimming and community building as a tool to empower people and create resilient communities. Sounds brilliant. Without further ado, please can we give a huge clap, a huge Caribbean links clap for Nathaniel Cole. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it's nice to get the Zoom claps. Um, sorry if my my lateness today. I had I was really strapped for time today, but I'm glad I made it on the call. Um, I haven't got a, a presentation, so I'll more just just speak to the green light on my laptop and and go from there. Um, Really today I want to talk about, I think, family, culture, um, fracture, aversion, and then class. 
Um, so the backstory on me, I'm of, Scott alluded to it there, um, talking about the different, I guess, ethnic groups you get across the Caribbean. I'm of mixed um, Indo and Afro-Caribbean descent. Um, my family, well, my mum's side of the family from Trinidad, um, and they, you know, essentially raised me. Um, and my father's side of the family from Jamaica. So I'm on a, a different, I guess, journey to reconnect with, with my Jamaican heritage. Well, it's ongoing. Um, so my family, I had to speak to my grandma for this. So thankfully she's still with us. Um, her parents or her great grandparents um, were from Punjab and um, Guyana met in Trinidad, had some babies and then had some more babies. And then, then you get my grandma, which is, she's one of 14. Um, and thankfully nine, nine survived. Um, so what I tried to ask her with my grandma, I was like, oh, what kind of culture did you grow up with? Um, and what did it mean for you to be living in Trinidad and amongst people that looked like you and obviously people of African descent in Trinidad as well um, in their particular neighborhoods and for her she actually said it was it was kind of like what what Vida was talking about how everyone was just together um, but I think me growing up and visiting the island over you know my years as a kid um, I always wondered why you know me and my brother and two of my, and my auntie and uncle were the only ones that looked like us. So out of my family, why was it that, you know, why, why did my mom have straight hair and I had curly hair and then everyone else kind of looked like they were from the same place, but then, then me and my brother were just there looking a bit different. Um, but it was never really talked about. So when I talk about culture and everything and, and family, I, I kind of mean that my family managed to, to preserve who they were to an extent but through the the mixing and assimilation they lost things like language um religion was often often traded with marriage um and then my grandma talks about her generation being they were the ones to kind of start to play mass and carnival to start going to parties but her parents and, and grandparents didn't engage in that stuff um and then the children have like a more more distant relationship with that so it doesn't come through in weddings and and modern day-to-day -day religion practices but it does when it's things like um you know how they practice their religion in their day-to-day -day. um so why when i think about how something i don't want to use the word diluted because i don't think it's that i think it's more like a, a missing and a, a missing links um that's why i use the word fraction to or fracture to discuss that so fracture is what I mean when my grandma can understand Arabic but not speak it, but her father could and his father could. Um, and I think, you know, when Scott, you're talking about trying to a journey of reconnection, I think that's where the generation is now because they're realizing that there's a lot of history wrapped up in our parents and, and grandparents that will be lost if we don't try and preserve these things. So I feel like if I feel like the community is currently in a, a fracture stage of assimilating and and under having certain aspects of of their culture but not being able to put the pieces together of the puzzle so i feel like now we're in a place where we're having to go back and and make our connect the dots ourselves and um, to rebuild all of those things and what i mentioned earlier with my family about how having the questions of why me and my brother look the way we do but the rest of the family didn't um I kind of want to talk about this aversion that we had um so I think in Trinidad how I've seen it is we talk about you know multiculturalism and you know one people um, and one island and coming together for for carnival and stuff but I always feel like there's there's divisions that are more subtle that you don't see um, I notice it when I would go shopping um, or go to a set, go to the movies and you see who who's at the movies, who's working at the movies, who's attending or if you, who's at the supermarkets and able to like, you know, buy all the, the electrical items that cost the same amount as they do here in the UK. Um, and that kind of moves me on to, oh, sorry, <laughs> I don't know why that speaker's come on. Just give me two minutes. <laughs>
sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think someone's trying to connect to the Bluetooth. Um, so what I would see is, I think to me is a conversation on class and, and who gets to occupy certain class structures and, and why that is. Um, for me, I look at if you come in, or if you're racialized as a certain way when you come into into our island like Trinidad, you know, under indentureship, we know it wasn't a, you know, it was essentially a lie from the, from the British Empire, but also indentureship gave still people a certain status that they could hold on to at least. Like um, there's research that shows that Indian women on the ships knew to get married on the ships because if you were married, you might have more um, bargaining power to get things like land and then jobs and stuff like that. And I feel like through through the history of practices like that and doing certain things like that it was able to to build a class for a people so when you look at me famous trinidadians it kind of splits amongst if they're famous trinidadians of, of afro descent it's often in the entertainment industry and um, when, when you look at it from indo or you know, indian descent it looks at scholarly practices business business and um, men and women so I feel like when I walk around, I can see the class divisions, but it doesn't get acknowledged too much because for the, I think the guys of, you know, people being placed there and, and wanting to kind of get along. But I feel like that getting along does, does come at a cost for people. So as I kind of finish and, and wrap up on, on what I want to say is that I, want, I would love for people to kind of think about the next steps and and what it means for people to, to one acknowledge acknowledge the differences, um, but also the roots of the differences on how they present in modern day. Like, how do we go from a place of talking about class um, in the Caribbean to a point where we can uplift more people um, and kind of lift them out of poverty and not go beyond just like the face value of stuff and what it, like people often hold up people with my mix or people like me to say that you know racism doesn't exist and all these things but i'm just a result of proximity um if you put people together they're going to make children um so really i want it to be a point of how can we kind of move forward together to uplift more people because i feel like as as much as i love the the asian caribbean um, experience and and the food i get to have in the culture um and that the rebuilding those links um you know the right for me to rebuild something shouldn't come at the cost of other people and i really want us to get to a point where we can can rebuild the links for everyone in the caribbean thank you so much for that nathaniel you just said something very poignant there you said that the rights for you to rebuild yourself shouldn't come at the cost of other people and that's really really important and the comments you made kind of suggesting kind of getting along over honesty and, and being honest about kind of the social injustices and the differences and treatment of different people of different descent so that was really really powerful thank you so much for that there's so there's so much i have to say Whilst you were all speaking, I was making notes. So uh, there's so much to have to say, but I'm gonna turn it over now to the audience now, because I can see that there are some questions. I didn't know if Stacey, if you would be able to read out some of the, the questions from the audience. I can see quite a few questions have been asked. Yeah, sure. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. Um, so there are actually three questions for Scott, <laughs> if you're ready to answer. Sorry, let me remove this spotlight. Um, so one is, which areas of China did the immigrants come from and what was their social economic situation in China? So majority of the Chinese would have come from, if you were to check the contracts, you would say Guangdong, but that's modern day Guangdong. But I also found out recently that some of the Chinese who came over to Jamaica in particular were actually from Hong Kong. So although majority of them would have come from Guangdong, you do have some Hong Kongers who would have also migrated to Jamaica, which I found interesting. I see the other thing is too, there's also the possibility that you have persons would have, who would have traveled from other parts of the country to Guangdong to go and get on board of the ships. So it's not gonna be that easy. And see, in terms of history, 
historical records is going to make it a little bit difficult because, for example, the archive of here in Ghana, we don't have those records preserved. So I'm just going off by what Luke Lai said about Trinidad. And I'm just assuming that it was the same for Ghana, but I cannot say definitively who oh, majority of them came. I'm just going on with it. And you see, the thing is, in terms of economic status, majority of them were poor. Uh, majority of them were just farmers, laborers. And the thing is, you know those Chinese films where you see people fighting a lot and those Kung Fu films? That was really the case for a lot of the Chinese because you had the different tribes and they would constantly be in wars, little civil wars, little disputes with each other. So that was the reality. And a lot of the people who would have boarded those ships is that they thought they would potentially get a more peaceful life. And quite a few of them were already outcasts. And to add to that as well, the first set of Chinese that came were all men. So then the governor was like, mm, it's one set of men, we got the well, yeah, last no women. And then what happened? They were like, okay, yeah, we're gonna send some women over. And uh, what were the women they sent? largely prostitutes. Um, yes. So when the Chinese men asked for women, the <laughs> British overseers gathered up local prostitutes, um, women with physical intellectual disabilities, and banded them together and sent them on the ship. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I get. <laughs> I can't even answer the next question. Um, I guess off the off the back of the the um the economic socioeconomic um kind of status of situation. Um, another question was that most Chinese had businesses. So where did they secure the finances in those early years? Oh, great question. So this is based largely from what I read from Dr. Walton Luglay. They would have saved. Up quite a lot. And then now this is where racial stereotypes come in. When the Chinese came, even on weekends, they tended to do extra work. That's why after a while, the indentureship contracts had to be more rigid that you can't move beyond a certain place because they were working on more than one plantations on the weekends to make extra money. So then the contracts are kind of baby to restrict that from happening. So they would do these little odd jobs in between to get extra money. And then now remember the scene. The enslaved Africans were emancipated. So now you had British overseers now painting this false dialogue as usual. That, oh, look how hardworking these Chinese people are. And then, oh, look how lazy these Africans are, and then, um, but the thing is that when I read it now, I'm just horrified because I'm thinking, how long were they enslaved for? How many um, centuries? And, and that's what you, so you see, it's actually from these historical documents now, th these um, stereotypes started to propel within society. And that's how a lot of them actually got their money. Some of them would have the ability to like make craft, some of them still had their skills in terms of Chinese traditional medicine. And these are things they would make and sell, not only to their own Chinese, but other races as well. So they would have their medicine skills. They would be able to make certain craft items, sew certain things. And that's what they used to make some of the extra money that they used eventually. Okay, wow. Um... I think alluding to what Aisha was saying is that is why it's so important to know your history and know where things come from, where stereotypes are are coming from. It that's yeah, that's just just wow, that's blown me away as well. Actually, what you just said <laughs> about where the stereotypes come from, um, and then the last question to you was: Please give more info on the impact of the opium wars on Chinese migration. Opium, yes, okay, so the whole idea was you give us tea 
This is the British. You give us tea leaves and we can have our tea. And we give you opium. And that's how it started. I actually wrote a poem based on that um, Red Red Love, which is going to be published this year in the Caribbean Quarterly. And it's all about that. You see, they started off with these things with opium as a little trade thing. First of all, the tea was a problem. Silver. The British didn't like that. The British wanted gold. They didn't like dealing with silver. So they had to come up with an alternative. And this is where opium came in. An interesting thing is what he brought in opium. Like, oh, you know, it has a lot of medicinal value. It's going to help you with this, help you with that. They even uh, kind of like, what is it? Part of their propaganda was selling it off as an aphrodisiac, which is what made it really boom from there, to be honest. And then as people started to get addicted, started to spread throughout and actually that is one of the tricks that they used yeah they had to be tricky so for example with the indians those who were very afraid about crossing the kalapani because they thought when you cross the kalapani you lost your connections to india you lost your cultural heritage so what some of them would do on the ships they would have these huge earthen jars and fill it with water from the Kalapani and use that to give a false assurance to the person that, oh, because the water is on the ship with you, you're not gonna lose anything. With the Chinese, especially those who they would have suspected had already become drug addicts, they used opium. And that's another thing as well. A lot of the men and the women who came, because remember, majority of them were prostitutes and they too did find themselves very much addicted to opium. And that was the trade off. Now, the thing with the opium, because the Chinese government got involved, they burnt down warehouses, they burnt down trading posts, but the British always found a way back in through the back door. And then finally, there was this ultimatum where they just burnt this huge warehouse down and all the opium, they took lime, they put lime on it and so, and then they burnt it. But it was also a huge realization to China that when they went up against these British and these British ships, that they were no match because they were very cut off. So they didn't really have that much access to guns and gunpowder and, the machine, the machines, the weaponry that the British had, it was beyond what they had. And most of them were peasants. They were more into like hand to hand combat. They had their swords and so on. But it was just no match to the British. So after the whole thing with the Opium Wars, they realized that we're lacking in a sense. And we need to explore these other sciences from the West. And that's what kind of prompted it after the opium wars. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, I hope that answers the questions to the person who posed it in the chat. Um, please feel free to, to ask any more. Um, I think I'll hand over to Andrew if you've got any further questions or seen any other questions. You're on mute, Afia. I, I apologize. Oh, you would have. Oh, wow. I apologize. Yeah, I, I had um, I had one question, um, but I'm not sure if there was someone in the chat who said it is interesting. I don't know if this has been read out already, so do correct me. Uh, it is interesting that this event was tagged as the Asian Caribbean experience, but many of your presenters are of mixed ethnicity. As someone who studies this, I wonder if, because you live in England, you consider yourself Asian, but in the Caribbean, you would not be considered mixed. And then they say that uh, many of the presenters would be either uh, considered Douglas, mixed, or uh, I hope I pronounced this properly, so do correct me, uh, Hakwai, I, I, I 
suspect I've probably pronounced that wrong, but that was the question posed in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. I can see that there's been a little bit of a discussion there. I don't know if anyone wants to go into any more detail. I know that like for my experience, I, I would just describe myself as mixed because I'm mixed Indo-Guyanese and white, but um, I have had experiences where people said that calling myself mixed doesn't really make sense which doesn't make sense to me <laughs> but it's like growing up as a teen I've always just said mixed race because it's the simplest one but then it's like I don't know to someone it depends like I think it's subjective to some people because like a lot of people are like you look like white and tanned so and I'm like I know but I'm telling you my origins <laughs> so it's quite confusing and I know that in the Caribbean that um Dougla is Indian and African and I wasn't like what would be consider mixed like I, I wanted to ask a question as well like I don't know because I know there are like disparities there in the UK and the Caribbean but for me I've just said I've mixed race because that's the simplest explanation for a lot of people I can I can, I can understand that and in in I noticed that um, in, in the Guyanese population, I think one category is mixed, is it? Yeah. That's one thing, but in, in some, some things I've written, I like to deal with the word culture because that appeals to me more. Two word, three words, multi-ethnic or multicultural appeals to me. And I, will, I, I, I like that. If I was mixed, I would prefer to be called multicultural chap or multi-ethnic. And that's quite common these days right across the world. And therefore it should be, one convenient term could be used to describe this. It's positive. It's not, it's not um, as it were in, in Ghanaian talk, can't help make you got to say that or whatever. No, I think it's a positive description and that's very good because uh, one can see if you talk about cultures how rich you all are i feel rich in one respect that is i'm not an wholly indian because i was born and brought up in guyana in a mixed cultural world i i feel i identify with the british here as much as i identify with my african neighbors in guyana my father's you know, contemporaries at school in, in the village and so on like that. So multi-ethnic, multicultural, I like. I think that suits better as well. And I like, that's why I think we need to raise awareness just because I want people to recognize Caribbean as being a word for this like rich mixture of cultures and ethnicities. So that's why I made that point about awareness. Just yes, to... if, I may, if I may develop on the point, because uh, something that I've lived with all my life is where I, I was as, as um, what's his name, his first name, Nick, um, Tingaki. Tingaki's first name is? Scott. Scott. Scott, forgive, forgive me, Scott. As Scott was saying, and the thing I've always grown up and lived with is it is that the the old colonial approach is to pigeonhole you into one sort of thing and you're meant to conform to that. Well, I've given up on all of that. I am me, whatever I am, you got to accept that because in today's world, that is what it is. In the old world, in the world I grew up with, you had to come conform. And therefore I'm happy with evolving that that notion and that language that describes us all here as whatever, multi-ethnic and enriched, and these are words I like. And I don't like when the moment you, you said something which is wonderful, Caribbean, but when we identify it is not what you or he or whatever thinks you are. It should, it should represent that enriched cultural setting 
do you know we are unique in that way compared to the old countries? We've got everybody there. All cultures are represented there. And therefore, when we say Caribbean, we shouldn't say what this guy says it means. It is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi this. Brilliant. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. Send a check. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to? Oh, sorry, Scott, you go. Yeah. And you see, that's the beauty of it that that's why I find a concept of purity within the Caribbean region to be kind of laughable because it really doesn't exist. For example, me, I am, yes, Chinese, I'm mixed with Portuguese, yes, but I'm also, I also have some Amerindian in me. I also have some African in me because apparently one of my great great grandfathers is, uh, was a farmer, you know, freed slave. And apparently, I also have some. Venezuelan Armenian in me as well. This is a, so in the Caribbean as well. It's not only that I oh, and I also met someone, this was about two years back, who was Jamaican, but their grandmother was Chinese, Guyanese Chinese. So there's a nice thing as well. Not only in the Caribbean are we mixed within the different races that are our perspective islands and countries, but in some instances, even across countries because of this migration that kept happening among the islands, especially for the Chinese. The Chinese, what they did as well, a lot of them migrated to Trinidad and Jamaica because their economies were booming compared to the Guyanese economy. And then from there, they went on to other places as well. So that happened right there too. Does anyone else want to answer that question as well? Because I can see that there's someone in the audience has their hand raised. So does anyone want to say anything? The only thing I was going to say is, um, it kind of just goes back to what I was saying when I was talking about my experience of coming here. And I think it's, it's already been put much better by the people is again it's the identity of knowing who you are and not not allowing yourself to be pigeonholed into what other people expect you to be um that's definitely one of the things that I found difficult when I moved to England is because there was this expectation and this stereotype of what a black girl looks like dresses like behaves like if you're from the Caribbean you have to walk and act and talk a certain way and I was like well I'm I've, I've just I've just come from Jamaica and this is not how this is not how we roll and I'm not I'm not into that I'm not down with that I'm you know this is this is what I'm gonna do um and again yeah like I said for me that meant it was difficult for me to fit in within those spheres in this country but again even with my sister you know so like for me I always grew up knowing I was knowing I was mixed but there was never any doubt of that you know that I was Jamaican and my sister had a has had a different experience to me, and that's just purely because of our facial features. So again, some people, when my hair's nice and straight, with my nose and everything, I've got my grandfather's nose. Um, people say to me, "Oh, I look Indian," <coughs> um, but my sister's got more of my dad's Tamil features. And again, there's a there's a, there's an expectation of her to behave, you know, speak like an Indian or or, or be more, you know, be more Indian on 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 face value. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's definitely something that's still prevalent today in, in Britain, in the society that we live in. Um, I've not been back to the Caribbean in a long time, but it's not something that I really remember growing up. Um, and I think that's something that's really important that we need to address and we need to teach our young people as well. Um, because I think that's sometimes where the, where the difficulty and sometimes the harm comes in as well. Um, that there's, you know, that the Caribbean is so much more than, you know, rice you know rice and peas and you know and music and there's, there's, there's so much diversity in history and culture there and it's really important that we we learn it and that we, we teach it I think thank we you are, so much we, 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 oh, we, we are we are in an embryonic stage perhaps not embryonic but we have forerunners in this in this in this world in that regard in terms of culture 
When you think back a little bit back to history 50, 60 years ago, culture blocks are European, Asian, African, etc., etc. But you know what? The Caribbean have brought them all together. And I'm, I, I don't, I, 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 res, I am very Indian, but I don't want, I would not be, I'm not going to say I'm entirely Indian, no way. I'm more Caribbean than anything else or Guyanese. And because I'm very proud of that enrichment that I acquired and my parents acquired being in that setting. And that's the new world. The new world for all of these great countries in the past, in the Europe and America, well, forget about America, but I'm talking about Europe and Asia and Africa. We are the new world, we Caribbeans. Call us what you like, but we are that. And we are of an enriched culture in my book. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question, I think, and that is, uh, I can see someone's got their hand raised. Would you like to speak? That I can see a, a raised hand. Yeah, so this is Alison here. Um, I'm the person who put the question in because like I said, I study, I study this issue quite a bit and I'm, I was really kind of curious because um, I'm not sure what the experience is. Like I asked a, a mixed race person, uh, someone we'd consider Dougla in the Caribbean and you're identifying, I guess, as Asian in, in England. And I, I wonder if that's just kind of, because yes, we know that race is a completely made up thing. There's no such thing as biological race, but it certainly is culturally relevant, right? And so there are contentions. And so when um, when the gentleman was talking about his experience growing up in Guyana, what I'm hearing is that because you have that, because we in the Caribbean have that really rich experience of living among people of various ethnic groups, we, if we choose to, we can learn to appreciate each other's culture. But let's not, I mean, again, as someone who studies this, there are people, and it may be based on, on class, who do strive for quote unquote purity, okay? Who do argue that Africans should only marry Africans and Hindus should only marry Hindus and, and Chinese should only, and Syrians and, and all this kind of stuff, right? So why we have a multicultural space, our individual family lives may not always allow for the physical mixing of people. So that's why I said there are times when purity, this idea of purity is contested. And in the Caribbean, and I've seen this even move out of the Caribbean space and into the American space, this concept of dogla um, is often contested, right? And there's one scholar who says, someone is only dogla for one generation. After that, they, they become African, okay? And so that's why I'm asking, I come back to my question about the experience of being in Britain rather than, you know, um, so how, how does someone of mixed race in Britain, why do you choose to identify as Asian and not necessarily as African or Jamaican or whatever it is? That was a really, really interesting comment that was made there. I think all of you have given us such food for thought Stacey, do you have any final words, anything you'd like to say? Sorry, now I'm on mute. Um, no, just just um, thank you everyone, um, really, for, for sharing your experience. Um, and it's been very useful for me to hear, to hear everything. And 
I think it's what, what strikes me as well and what we've tried to do is get um, speakers from you know all generations and that's the idea behind Caribbean links is that we hear from you know our elders who are passing on knowledge to us so that we sort of also know what has come before what the past is and as I again as Aisha was alluding to knowing our own history um, but also from from younger people to know what the experience is now and has it actually changed or not um, and it seems like a lot of people have you know very similar similar experiences um, and as I said the idea behind Caribbean links is to try and get people together so we can share this information and it's been a very very good evening so I just want to thank all the speakers um, very much um, for coming um, also want to thank the Caribbean links team um, so even though two of us are not here today everyone has been working hard behind the scenes to kind of get this event together and um, we'll also obviously put on other events in the future and you can follow us i'm just going to put it in the chat now um on instagram and on twitter um just to keep up as, as to what the our other events are but yeah thank you very much for for the guests for attending as well um so hand back over to you Afia. Thank you so much, Stacey. The next virtual panel event will be about quail, particular, particularly Dominican and St. Lucian quail, its history and grammatical structure. We are hoping to have a session where we can actually learn how to speak these languages because we're really passionate about just continuing to learn more about our culture and, and learning to speak all of our languages and just keep sharing all this wonderful information. So much has happened this evening in terms of knowledge sharing, I've made loads of notes. I have loads of comments and things. I'm going to have to go back and look up. I've got some new Instagram pages that I'm going to need to follow courtesy of Gina. I've got some books that I'm going to be reading. Thanks to Scott I've, and, and Gina. I've got, I've got a lot of information here that I personally will be going to look over myself. So I want to just, before we go this evening, just say thank you again so much to all of our brilliant panelists for their presentations. They were just brilliant and we've We've really learned a lot and thank you so much for your time. I want to thank again the audience. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the Caribbean Inks team. I, I'm really grateful to be working with such amazing team members. And that's it for the for, for this for this month. We'll be back uh, for our next session on Quail. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a lovely evening, a lovely bank holiday weekend. If, it, if it's bank holiday weekend where you are. And we'll see you next time. Bye everyone, have a lovely evening. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs>